have evidence that they leaked false and defamatory information about him to the media. I have asked repeatedly that they conduct an internal investigation and find the source of that leak, and they have refused to do so. We have evidence that there was collusion in concocting this case between folks subordinate to Mr. Baker and Mr. Baker and an attorney inside the Pentagon who actually raised his own questions in emails we have about whether or not this case was retaliatory. But then instead of following up on that, he proceeded to instruct these folks on how to hide the retaliatory intent. It's truly stunning. I've never seen anything like this. I'm Ben Weingarten, and this is Big Ideas with Ben Weingarten, a podcast where we talk with exceptional thinkers and doers about the most important ideas and issues of our time and all time. Much has been made of President Trump's revocation of the security clearance of former CIA director John Brennan, something that as commander-in-chief he had clear legal authority to do. But what happens when you're an active, distinguished member of the national security apparatus and you blow the whistle on malfeasance in your office involving politically sensitive figures, only to find that the deep state has put a target on your head. Don't believe in the deep state? Well, suddenly, in spite of your spotless record, a series of charges are lobbed at you. You're bad-mouthed in the press. You get appointed to a higher position on account of your service and your shared views with the incoming presidential administration, only for the probes executed by holdovers from the prior adversarial administration your bosses, to intensify, ultimately leading to your demise. You aren't even able to mount a defense because the people raising the charges don't give you the basic information you've requested to make your case. You might have to plead this case in front of people representing the very bureaucracy that swallowed you up and spit you out in the first place. And since they've thrown you out of office without pay, good luck funding your defense in all the cases you're litigating. This isn't the stuff of conspiracy theories. This is the real-life story of Pentagon analyst Adam Lovinger. And while it is one of several stories of pro-Trump officials who have gotten pushed out of office, allegedly on political grounds, by holdovers from the Obama administration, if what Mr. Lovinger asserts about his cases is true, it is illustrative of the greater rot and corruption within our federal bureaucracy. And this is a bipartisan problem. It transcends administrations. The idea that if you rock the boat, you'll pay a price is fundamentally un-American. It should concern you regardless of political party. Power should only be wielded under the assumption that you'd wish to give that very same power to your worst enemy. Unfortunately, in our government today, power is often exerted with little forethought as to the long-term consequences. And worse, those who wield it in the bureaucracy, unfairly or worse, tyrannically, are very rarely, if ever, held accountable, which means the problems only fester. Due process and accountability are a couple of the things that separate us from third world countries. These are the stakes of what we're witnessing today, which again transcend any one administration. Whether we retain the principles that have made America what it is, or we become something unrecognizable. Joining me today is Sean Bigley, a man who worked in the federal bureaucracy and then left to defend whistleblowers and others in national security cases involving issues like retaliatory security clearance revocations to discuss the case of his client, Adam Lovinger, and much more. If you like the conversation you're about to hear, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the podcast, rating and reviewing the podcast in the iTunes store or wherever else you're listening to us. And if you want to find out more about the show, you can visit our website at benweingarten.com slash big ideas and follow me on Twitter at BH Weingarten. And now without further ado, my conversation with Sean Bigley. Sean, in your vast experience in this area of national security clearances and protecting, defending whistleblowers, have you seen historically that security clearances have been politicized, i.e. potentially revoked or at least suspended for reasons other than merit? Absolutely, Ben. Uh, You know, this is kind of one of the dirty secrets of Washington, uh, and and that is that, you know, security clearances are 
a necessary tool, uh, oftentimes for employment. Um, I, I often uh, liken them to the equivalent of a professional license for a, a doctor or a lawyer or somebody of that nature. Without it, you're not going to get work in a number of fields, uh, intelligence, diplomacy, uh, oftentimes many career fields in the military, things like that. And so it's a, a tool that is often misused by uh, folks who are looking to settle a political score or a personal vendetta or retaliate against a whistleblower. This is not uh, anything new, uh, despite what uh, people like John Brennan and and those folks uh, would, would lead us to believe this has been happening for many years. And it happens because there are no real safeguards in place uh, to prevent this type of abuse. There have been very few efforts made uh, in the Congress uh, and, and even fewer efforts made within the executive branch to address this type of behavior. And so it's, it's, uh, it's run amok. And uh, you know, it's, it's really becoming a, a significant problem, uh, I think, now that it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, being exposed to daylight. And in your experience, is this a bipartisan issue? In other words, does politicization of security clearances transcend whatever administration as, is in power and actually get to the idea that those who are at the top political leaders within institutions – want to retain their positions and maintain status quo and will do anything to retain that power? So it's interesting because, uh, you know, historically we have seen the misuse of clearances fall more into the whistleblower retaliation and the uh, settling of personal vendetta categories. It's been really kind of a newer phenomenon that we've seen the politicization of security clearances uh, and, you know, I, I don't say that from a, a partisan perspective necessarily, even though I, I do support President Trump and I, I don't, you know, uh, I don't make any, uh, um, you know, efforts to conceal that. But, uh, you know, truly this is something that prior to uh, the president's election had not really been on our radar. And, and just, you know, to give some perspective there, this is uh, our entire practice. We do about a couple hundred of these cases a year, and so we have a pretty good bird's eye view of the trends and the, the patterns in this field. And uh, really, it was it was very surprising to me uh, the the extent to which this immediately became a political tool uh, once President Trump came into office. Uh, and, and by that, I mean a tool of those who were seeking to thwart his nominees and appointees from coming into the government. And so uh, I, I don't know where along the line, you know, folks in the bureaucracy sort of decided that this would be a, a good political weapon, but there was a, a very clear shift that we saw for the first time that, that this was being used for political purposes. And of course, the client most notable who you have defended with respect to revocation, suspension and then revocation of security clearances and a whole host uh, of other reprimands is Adam Lovinger. So let's start with this. Mr. Lovinger was working at the Office of Net Assessment, the ONA, within the Department of Defense. It's been characterized as essentially an in-house think tank there. And in 2016, he raised a series of issues about malfeasance within the ONA to its director, James Baker, who had been appointed to that position by then-Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter in, I believe, 2015. What were the issues that Mr. Lovinger raised? So Mr. Lovinger uh, raised uh, issues pertaining to the misuse of contractors that were really centered around two broad categories. Uh, the first category was he was concerned that these folks were being paid uh, a very large amount of money to do very little. Uh, and you know, when you look at the contracts that were being given uh, to to these net assessment contractors, uh, who Mr. Lovinger uh, said were sort of a very politically connected few, uh, they they really don't bear a relationship to the work that was actually being performed. And so, you know, that that gross uh, waste of taxpayer funds, as Mr. Lovinger perceived it, was something that he really took issue with, uh, and, and felt that ONA needed to be a better steward of taxpayer funds. The second concern uh, was a violation of law, and uh, again, pertaining to misuse of contractors, he was saying, 
under federal law, it is very clear we cannot use these contractors to go out and conduct foreign relations. And by that, I mean sending them out unsupervised across the globe to meet with foreign dignitaries and have discussions about various policy matters uh, or, or matters of concern to the United States and then essentially report back to ONA on their findings. And it was very clear that that's what they were doing. Uh, and in addition, there were actually some documents uh, that have uh, come into our possession that specifically identify some of these contractors as U.S. representatives. Uh, that's the actual terminology that's used uh, to these foreign governments. And so, uh, you know, he said this is, this is improper, this is wrong, it's against the law. These contractors can be uh, usurping, uh, you know, their interactions with these foreign dignitaries for their own selfish motivations that may not be consistent with the interests of the United States. This process has to stop. And he was ignored. They continued to fund the contractors. They continued to give them these outrageous contracts. And then weeks to months later, uh, all of a sudden, after 12 years at ONA without a single problem, a single blip on the radar, and year after year of stellar performance evaluations, now he becomes a quote-unquote problem. And two of those contractors, of course, as we'll get to in a minute, were highly politically sensitive. One, a close associate of Hillary Clinton's daughter, and it appears Hillary Clinton, while at the State Department, lobbied for that contractor effectively, and the other, an informant who is embedded and, it appears, sought to entrap uh, both Trump campaign officials and then officials within his administration. But before we get to all that, between September 2016 and October 2016, there was a probe into Mr. Lovinger regarding his reading of a document with a pending security conf- classification on an airplane. Tell us about that episode, because that appears to be really the first inquiry into Mr. Lovinger. Yeah, so this is really interesting. This is uh, definitely uh, sort of the, the trigger point that started all of this. And uh, what happened was uh, he was going on a, uh, a, a trip uh, for official business. He, prior to departing, had picked up a stack of reading material to take with him on the airplane and uh, very carefully and diligently looked through that stack, uh, flipped through it from the top to make sure that there was no classified information in there uh, that would be a problem for him to, to take outside the office, uh, confirmed that there was not, and took the papers and, and went on his trip. Uh, he subsequently, while on the airplane uh, and, and going through these papers, uh, grew concerned that one of the documents uh, had a marking uh, in the footer of the document on, I think, the, the 11th or the 14th page or something like that, that seemed to indicate that it may contain some classified information. So he immediately uh, moved to secure the document, put it away, uh, and then uh, subsequently, upon arriving at his destination, uh, turned it over to the local uh, security officials and, and had it discarded. And now, you know, what's interesting about this is classified information is supposed to be marked, and there are very, very specific regulatory requirements for how it is marked precisely to prevent this type of an oversight. And uh, it was not marked. There was no uh, what we call in, the, in this field a cover page, meaning a, a page on it that says top secret or secret or anything like that. Uh, there was no uh, markings whatsoever on, on the exterior of the document that would indicate it was classified. And in fact, we believe that the document wasn't. Uh, it was written by an academic, a college professor who was on loan to the office. And the, the material uh, should not have been anything that was classified. But uh, they used that, they weaponized that against him and essentially said, you know, this was, uh, you know, a, a, a gross lapse of judgment and this was a problem and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what we keep coming back to is, you know, Mr. Lovinger had no reasonable way of knowing that this document, if it was classified, was classified. And, and so they failed in their responsibilities to mark the document and now they're holding him accountable for that. And it bears noting that Mr. Baker had sent an email previously to staffers basically acknowledging that he knew that people would at times have to bring home documents and basically just to use the utmost care when they did so. And clearly you're arguing that that Mr. Lovinger did, in fact, act in accord with that request. Now, how close was that probe into reading this document in an airplane to some of the emails that Mr. Lovinger had sent to Mr. Baker? 
it was right around the same time. So the when you look at the timeline of you know these these whistleblower disclosures, they were all occurring uh, late summer through the fall of 2016, which was exactly when this incident occurred. And at the time the incident occurred, it was relatively early in his whistleblower disclosures. So what's fascinating about it is they did an investigation, they wrote up a memorandum that essentially exonerated Mr. Lovinger of wrongdoing. And the memorandum says uh, this was a uh, inadvertent, is the word that they use, uh, violation, and uh, essentially confirms that there were no exterior classification markings on the document, and he had no way of knowing that there was an issue. And yet, fast forward a few months, all of a sudden, the narrative changes, and what was an inadvertent violation at the time, documented as such, now becomes a, a, a much bigger issue, and they sort of use that as the, as the, the basis to blow up this, this concern about him. You mentioned that Mr. Lovinger had had around a 12-plus year career working in national security, focusing mainly on foreign threats such as China, Iran, Islamic supremacism, etc., and he had been, I believe, provided uh, in terms of his reviews with exceptional ratings essentially through 2016. Had Mr. Lovinger ever been subject to a similar inquiry to this first one? Not one. And, you know, that's pretty uh, pretty notable in, in 12 years of dealing on a daily basis uh, with highly classified information uh, and the, the many opportunities that that presents for inadvertent uh, and, you know, mistakes, good faith mistakes. Uh, and, you know, that's something that we see all the time. We see, you know, good people who work in this field and who clearly had no intent to, to, to do anything wrong, but they inadvertently bring their cell phone into a, a classified area or they mistakenly uh, commingle documents that are classified with unclassified. And so for him to not have any violations whatsoever for over a decade really speaks you know, to, to the level of care that he was exercising uh, in his job. Fast forward several months, Donald Trump is elected president, and Mr. Lovinger is tabbed to join the National Security Council in a fairly senior director position. And his views, as I understand them, are in accord largely with those of the president on national security and foreign affairs, as well as the then incoming national security advisor, Mike Flynn. What happens from the point he is tabbed to join NSC? So he departs uh, for NSC uh, in January 2017 uh, to join the incoming administration, and they they continue these uh, these internal probes that they've launched. Uh, Mr. Baker has launched. There's actually two of them that are running uh, concurrently, and uh, the investigators and I use that term very loosely that he tapped to run these probes. Uh, were grossly unqualified for the job. One was a subordinate, a direct subordinate to Mr. Baker, uh, and yet was supposed to be conducting an independent investigation. The other one was a direct subordinate of uh, another Obama official, Stephen Hedger. Uh, We actually have evidence that Mr. Baker drafted the documents that Mr. Hedger signed initiating that investigation. So it was essentially just a farce to provide a, a, the appearance of a, a bit of daylight between Mr. Baker and the, and the second investigation. Uh, and, and these folks, neither of them had any training in investigations, any training in law. They were, they were picked essentially because they were political hacks. Uh, and uh, you know, they were purporting to conduct these national security investigations, uh, and yet they have an entire office of inspector general at the Department of Defense that's staffed with investigators who are trained and available just for that purpose. So it's very clear they were looking to reach a predetermined conclusion and one that you know wouldn't be subject to any outside scrutiny. Uh, they, they ultimately did. Uh, what's interesting is they hid those conclusions from us for uh, 14 months after they ultimately suspended Mr. Lovinger's security clearance, they were required by executive order to turn them over within 30 days. They refused that. And then they demanded that we respond to their allegations without ever turning over a single document to us. So we had to respond blindly to these very vague allegations of wrongdoing. They came back to us and said, you didn't respond adequately enough to our allegations. And we said, well, you didn't give us a document. You didn't, you didn't turn over a single thing. Uh, despite your requirement to do so, uh, 
And, uh, you know, that, that's that been a real theme in this process is, is, you know, sort of rigging the process at multiple steps from the investigation all the way to the actual revocation to ensure that he was not getting due process. Have you ever seen an instance in your career where the evidence and communications regarding Mr. Lovinger internally with those making these decisions was withheld or redacted to the extent that it has been in his case? Not once. And, you know, there were a number of other things that they did as well that feeds into this pattern and and paints a very clear picture of what they were trying to do to him. Uh, For example, uh, we have evidence uh, that they leaked false and defamatory information about him to the media. Uh, I have asked repeatedly that they conduct an internal investigation and find the source of that leak, and they have refused to do so. Uh, We have evidence that there was collusion uh, in concocting this case uh, between uh, folks subordinate to Mr. Baker and Mr. Baker uh, and an attorney uh, inside the Pentagon uh, who actually raised his own questions in emails we have about whether or not this case was retaliatory. Uh, But then instead of following up on that, he proceeded to instruct these folks on how to hide the retaliatory intent. Uh, it, it's truly it, it's truly stunning. I've never seen anything like this. And what really perplexes me is the extent to which these individuals at the Pentagon have dug in their heels. Uh, there is, is absolutely no effort by anybody to, uh, you know, uh, reach a, a, a mediated uh, resolution or Uh, act within accordance of basic due process norms or fundamental fairness. They just don't care, and it's, it's truly appalling. Among the allegations that have been publicly disclosed, raised by the Department of Defense, in addition to the reading of that document on an airplane trip, were the following. Sending official documents to a personal email account, trying to undermine the authority of Mr. Baker, refusing to cooperate with Mr. Baker's investigators, leaking confidential information that ended up in a news story, an unauthorized trip to Israel, which I understand that charge was subsequently dropped, and unauthorized contacts with the Indian government, although Ash Carter himself had written a letter commending Mr. Lovinger for his work at ONA with India. Do you dispute every allegation raised by the Department of Defense, or is there merit to any of them? It's, they're, they're all a total farce. And, you know, just to put this in perspective, because I know some people might say, well, gee, that sounds like a lot of stuff there. I mean, you know, there must be something to it. What the Department of Defense did in this case is they floated a number of trial balloon charges in the media against Mr. Lovinger before they told us a single thing that he was accused of, of doing wrong and before they ever put pen to paper to formalize any allegations. So what they were trying to do essentially is figure out what would stick. And every time they would float these trial balloon charges and leak this stuff in the media, we would immediately shoot it down. And so the uh, the bar mitzvah travel to Israel that, they, that he supposedly was uh, unapproved to do, that was immediately shot down with documentary evidence. The purportedly unauthorized interactions with Indian government officials, that was immediately shot down with evidence. So ultimately what we wound up with was – a set of just really vague, really nebulous allegations against him, like you tried to undermine your boss, Mr. Baker. Well, okay. What, what does that mean? You know, and, and, you know, what we, what we ultimately believe and what we ultimately responded with is all of these allegations that they hit him with center around, uh, for the most part, uh, He's purportedly plotting or or conniving to try to uh, undermine uh, Mr. Baker. Well, if you look at the paper trail, in fact, what he was doing was he was telling Mr. Baker and he was telling any other others in the office, you guys can't do what you're doing. It's illegal. It's improper. It's a gross waste of funds. And they have spun that and and, and turned it on its head and, and made it as though he essentially was uh, trying to to uh, you know launch some sneaky uh, attack against Mr. Baker. The facts and the evidence just don't bear it out, and we're very confident that 
we have the facts and the evidence on our side. The problem is they have the process on their side, and they have weaponized that at every turn. Yeah, so explain the process part of this a little bit, because it strikes me here that ultimately, even if you prevail in front of uh, one essentially administrative judge, then you end up facing another panel, which apparently had overseen many of the actions taken against Mr. Levenger, which strikes me as sort of defining the problem with the administrative state itself, which is that the the administrative state is judge, jury, and executioner in cases involving itself. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. That's that's precisely how I have described it as well. And so the the process for, uh, uh, you know, revoking uh, a security clearance is essentially this. The the government, uh, the, the agency in question, will issue or the individual written notice of the allegations. It's supposed to be as detailed and comprehensive as national security permits. They failed to do that here. Then uh, the individual is supposed to be provided with the government's evidence against him so he can mount a an effective and meaningful rebuttal. They failed to do that here and, in fact, just refused to do it. Uh, then the the uh, appeal that is mounted, uh, that written appeal, is supposed to be reviewed and adjudicated. And if it's successful, then that's the end of the process. If it's not, then the individual moves to the second and final stage in the process, which varies slightly by agency. In this case, there's a weird quirk in Department of Defense policy that says, you, Mr. Lovinger, are entitled to go before an administrative judge, an independent administrative judge, who will have a hearing and render a decision. But for whatever reason, that decision is only going to be a recommended decision, which will then go back along with the rest of your file to a panel of unaccountable bureaucrats who report directly to the same woman who has been uh, leading the charge against him from day one. And uh, these folks are a very obscure administrative arm of the Pentagon called Washington Headquarters Services, WHS, Their director, Barbara Westgate, is a woman who was plucked out of retirement by the Obama administration six months before the election. And uh, she is in cahoots with Mr. Baker. We know this because uh, all of the contracts that Mr. Lovinger was complaining about, WHS was actually the official contracting counterparty on for ONA. So in essence, WHS is incentivized to retaliate against him because he was implicating them in his whistleblower complaints. So, you know, how that provides a just and independent process is a mystery to me. Uh, It's a mystery to many other folks as well. And I have asked repeatedly that uh, WHS and Ms. Westgate be recused from any further involvement in this case. I've asked that it be transferred to any other agency in the federal government or that the administrative judge's decision be allowed to be final. uh, And they have refused all of those requests. And you've argued this goes all the way up to the office of Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis. Explain that. So uh, Secretary Mattis uh, is unfortunately uh, surrounded by a group of folks who we feel uh, are shielding him from some of the uh, things that are happening in the bureaucracy beneath him, uh, particularly uh, a gentleman, Kevin Sweeney, who is his chief of staff, Uh, We have raised these issues with Mr. Sweeney repeatedly. Uh, I have directly and and personally brought them to his attention, uh, and each time he has ignored us um, and shifted responsibility to his subordinates, uh, who are precisely the ones who are are, uh, running running the show uh, in this process. And so, uh, you know, there's sort of a willful blindness there, uh, or an arrogance of power, I would say. Uh, but it's it's really unfortunate because it's creating sort of a wall between Secretary Mattis and his own staff. Now, as I hinted at before, part of what was uncovered by Mr. Lovinger was contracts, I believe over $11 million in contracts doled out over the years, I believe over a decade, to a close personal friend of Chelsea Clinton, Hillary Clinton's daughter. And Hillary Clinton had apparently lobbied on behalf of of this person and her company to receive Department of Defense contracts, as well as the revelation or the whistleblowing that the contracts that Stefan Halper were receiving were outsized, and it was unclear that they were justified under ONA's uh, modus operandi. Explain what Mr. Lovinger uncovered, and do you believe that there's a direct 
link between what he uncovered and there being a political rationale for the inquiries into him? Sure. So uh, first off, we absolutely believe that there is a a political motivation behind this uh, with respect to the retaliation. I I don't think it's any coincidence that the contractors he was pointing out uh, were Stefan Halper and the uh, very close confidant of the Clinton family. Uh, I think it explains a lot as far as the ferocity behind the retaliation efforts against him, which I have never seen uh, in my career, despite practicing exclusively in this area. Um, You know, what he was addressing with respect to these two contractors, uh, I'll give you an example um, with respect to the Clinton Tide contractor. Those folks uh, were producing reports uh, at, at great taxpayer expense on topics like whether or not there were enough coastal elites in the national security bureaucracy uh, and whether or not Americans are a warlike people. Those are actual topics of reports by this contractor. Now, I suppose everyone can reach their own conclusions about whether or not that informs policymakers and and is, is worth the expenditure of taxpayer funds, but Mr. Lovinger certainly felt that it was not. Uh, Now, that's not to say that these folks weren't doing other work that may have been uh, of more value, but nonetheless, he felt that they were not qualified to to serve as a a contractor and that they were not performing work that was uh, of significant value. Uh, With respect to Mr. Halper, uh, you know, he was being paid multiples of what other contractors in the office were being paid to conduct, at least on paper, uh, similar uh, projects. And uh, one particularly notable example was uh, a gentleman in the office who is a true uh, and very preeminent uh, scholar on China. He speaks Mandarin. He has uh, incredible advanced degrees and incredible knowledge on the topic. Uh, he was being paid a third or a fourth of what Mr. Halper was being paid to conduct a study on China. So when you look at things like that, Mr. Lovinger was saying, there's really a disconnect here between what we're paying these people to do and what they're actually doing. And he was concerned, you know, in hindsight, with regard to Mr. Halper, uh, you know, that, that there were some things that, that maybe Mr. Halper was doing that were off the books uh, as far as, you know, explaining that difference in, in uh, what he was actually being paid to do on, on paper and, and, and what he was being paid. And so, you know, of course, at the time, he didn't know what Mr. Halper was up to. Nobody knew. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to question in hindsight whether or not the, the leadership of net assessment and, and, and other folks who were facilitating these contracts uh, were aware. And if there was an ulterior motive behind the, these inflated contracts, if they were essentially using Mr. Halper to conduct their dirty work uh, or, or to run an off the book spy operation uh, and, and go after enemies of the Obama administration, folks like General Flynn, who we know uh, Mr. Halper was was being sort of uh, sicked on as early as 2014. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that are raised here. Um, I think the, the most important thing is that at the time Mr. Ha- Mr. Lovinger was raising them, he was raising them without any political designs. He was just trying to do what we ought to expect from all of our government employees, and that is be a good steward of taxpayer dollars and be a vanguard against uh, abuse of the administrative state. If Mr. Lovinger could deliver a message to President Trump about his his plight and more broadly the problems plaguing our federal bureaucracy, what would that message be? I think, you know, uh, what he would want the president to, to know or to, to see more specifically is the ramifications that this has had on him and his family. We're talking about a guy who has three children, has a mortgage, is the primary breadwinner, and because he had the audacity to come forward and expose wrongdoing, he has been dragged through the mud for the last 18 months. He has been stripped of his security clearance, stripped of his pay, and stripped of his dignity. And that is not how we should treat whistleblowers in this country. Uh, There really needs to be an investigation into this, and we are hopeful that the president uh, will step forward and assert some uh, adult supervision of this case, which has been uh, seriously lacking to date. Um, And so, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think there's going to be some additional uh, 
things that come out uh, in the next few days that are going to uh, further interest in this, uh, and we'll see what happens. Lastly, what reforms would you suggest be made to protect people like Adam Lovinger, and, and can we expect the administrative state to clean itself up? Well, I definitely don't think we can expect the administrative state to clean itself up. I think they've had far too long uh, already to demonstrate that they can do that, and they have utterly failed. So uh, I would propose, and, and a number of people have proposed, uh, assigning uh, somebody within the administration to serve as a sort of uh, drain the swamp czar, if you will, and coordinate all of the efforts that are long overdue to rein in the bureaucracy, to uh, establish some accountability, and to ensure that these folks remember at the end of the day who is paying their salaries and that the voters are in charge. Um, as far as specific reforms, there are two things very briefly that I would like to see. Uh, number one, I would like to see uh, defined penalties added to the uh, provision in the law that allows Mr. Lovinger to seek redress for retaliation on his security clearance. There are defined provisions in the Whistleblower Protection Act, but that act only applies to uh, other uh, actions, disciplinary actions, and things like that that do not uh, cor uh, correlate with a security clearance. Uh, so that's number one. I mean, I think these folks need to be on notice. These retaliators need to be on, a, on notice what they are looking at if they are caught. Uh, and then the second thing is, I think that, the, you know, cutting off somebody's paycheck who is fighting a whistleblower uh, case uh, is, is a really egregious abuse because it, it puts them in an untenable position where they have to choose uh, whether or not they're going to continue this fight. And, and the folks who are largely holding the keys to the timeline here are, are the same folks who cut off the paycheck. So I think that, you know, there needs to be a, a little bit of a, of a second look as far as uh, whether or not it's appropriate to cut off the paycheck uh, of somebody who has raised a whistleblower retaliation claim, a credible whistleblower retaliation claim. Sean, thanks so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do help us out by subscribing to, rating, and reviewing Big Ideas with Ben Weingarten in the iTunes Store or wherever else you're listening to us. I'm your host, Ben Weingarten. You can find out more about the podcast at benweingarten.com slash big ideas or at bhweingarten on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time.